This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash ev9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real-life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award-winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Postmortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. Hey guys, it's Amino Hassan and Zach Harper here on Cinephobe. Uh, before we get this episode started, we just wanted to say we're following the news. We know what's happening all over the country. We're equally outraged and disgusted at the acts of police violence happening against protesters out there. Saying all this to say, we realize Cinephobe is a fun space. We poke a lot of fun. The episode that you're about to listen to, we actually recorded this weeks ago, but we felt it wouldn't be right to drop it in these circumstances without at least acknowledging that stuff is going on in this country. Look, we're hoping that this can be, you know, anywhere from an hour to an hour and 20 minutes or whatever this ends up being of a reprieve from whatever you're going through, whatever the country's going through, if you decide to listen to it, or if you save it, I mean, honestly, like, I don't even know if I can you know, watch stuff to, to laugh right now. Like I, I don't, I don't really know what to do other than to be outraged by the police brutality and the way that they're turning these protests into, into demeaning things that are distracting from the, from the issue at hand. And so if you decide to save this episode, if you're not in the mood, uh, I think that's smart. If you decide you, you know, this is how you want to process this by taking an hour out of the day and, and trying to see if, if it'll make you laugh. I think that's smart. I, I'm not going to tell anyone how to, process and grieve but we just wanted to let you know that we are obviously aware as Amin said and we're trying to be as proactive as possible and trying to help figure out what to do um and we don't take this stuff like on to the episode this is how christopher columbus must have felt right when he's he, like oh look i discovered this new amazing land now nah, it turns out that a bunch of other people have been here before and that's how i feel about team witch man i was so excited and watching this thing and then may starts throwing in the chat all these other People made references or jokes about it. I, I don't feel as, as good anymore. One, I definitely feel pillaged. So you're the Christopher Columbus of this podcast. I got smallpox. I got big pox right now, I'll tell you. Two, you didn't discover a movie from 1989. <laughs> no, I did. Like, it's one of those things that no one knew existed. And then... No. <laughs> no, just because the three of us didn't know it existed didn't mean people didn't know it existed. I got to say that I, don't, I think the world didn't know this existed. I'm just going to throw that out there. It's only a discovery when I I'm going to throw it back. <laughs> you can throw it out there. I'm throwing it back. The world knew about it. The world did not know about this. Oh, my God. The world? The world knew about this. I'll tell you what. I wish I didn't know about it. Put it on the Twitter poll. Uh, did you know about this? And I got to say, personally, I didn't know about this. So I just want to put that my answer into the question. I mean, I think there's a very <laughs> specific sub-demo that got exposed to this movie, which we'll get to in the trivia that is responsible for this. Women? I know w just one piece of trivia from this movie, and I was pretty shocked about it. I'll reveal it at some point. Is it the trivia that this is the movie that broke up the podcast? Imagine how, watching this on a train, by the way. I, re this is, I swear, midway through this movie, well, as I'm drawing tears because I'm laughing so hard at this movie, I said, my only regret is that we did not watch this on the, on the train. I would have jumped off the train. Top that. <laughs> Your picks have been horrible, man. It's the point. It's the point of the show. Isn't, Isn't it? it? Isn't, Isn't it? it? It's Isn't possible. It? I don't understand what this podcast is about. Poppycock. It's a fuck house. On a weekly basis, we are consuming more concentrated bad movies than probably anybody in the history of mankind. Poppycock. What story? What story? 
are you talking about? Do you want lunch? I have yet to laugh in this movie. I'll just tell you that. You picked it, motherfucker. <laughs> just remember that. You know what the problem with Hollywood is? They make shit. Unbelievable, unremarkable shit. So I was legitimately offended. You were offended? I was, a, I was offended. I didn't know you could get offended. I was offended. This did it. If I were gay, I wouldn't be offended. <laughs> They're fucking making shit up, I mean. Inconsequential detail after inconsequential yeah. detail after inconsequential detail. Please don't lie. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm there holding a mic in my hands and now I'm talking yeah, all over. <laughs> Welcome to Cinephone Podcast. We break down the movies you're afraid to admit you love. I'm Zach Harper. That's Emil Hassan. That's Anthony Mays. Just a reminder, if you have a submission, it needs to be 40% or lower on Rotten Tomatoes for either the audience score or the critic score. We love that you guys want to submit movies, but you got to know the rules by now. Okay? 40% or less. 54%. That's not under 40, is it? What if it's a 53%? Still doesn't qualify, I mean. How about a 61%? No, see, now we're going in the wrong direction. Ah. Yeah. But again, we love the activation of the audience. 40% or less, please. This week on Cinephobe, we watched the 1989 comedy, Teen Witch. By the way, I like how you kind of like, you softened it for them in case there's someone out there, well, I'll never listen to this podcast again. You know why? (laughs) Because I'm a little defeated and dejected from this movie. Oh, come on. This is one of the more enjoyable movies we've watched. What? This is one of the more enjoyable movies we've watched. Maze, you, I mean, come on. What's happening here? It's, it's the thing. This is the thing that happens. I understand why Amin was excited to watch this movie. I am irritated by this trend that you guys have of throwing out you guys. Picks back to back that are weirdly a diptych. So we did Coffee and Cream, then we did Cop Out. Oh, yeah. No, there was. Now we're doing Teen Wolf to Teen Witch. What are you guys trying to do to me here? What's Wolf and a Witch? Wolf and a Witch. Let me just be clear here. So I was perusing through the uh, channels a couple of weeks ago, landed on this movie Teen Witch. I thought I was watching the beginning of it after watching it. Today, for this podcast, I realized I did not watch the beginning. I caught 15 minutes into the movie. So I thought that was the beginning of the movie. Come to find out, no, there was a whole 15 minutes before it, and boy, is it glorious. But yes, you're right, Maze. There are a lot of similarities between this movie and Teen Wolf 2. I'll spoil some trivia right now. The film was originally intended to be a female version of Teen Wolf, 1985, and it went as far as to borrow the design for the lettering, the tagline, and the shell of the plot line. Oh, wow. What shell? What plot line? Oh, come on, Zach. We have 40 minutes of this movie. Nothing's happened. What plot? Plenty has happened. What are you talking about? Teen Witch stars Robin Lively. Obviously, you know her from Karate Kid 3. By the way, Robin Lively, older sister of Blake Lively. How about that? Half-sister, yeah. How about that? That's my trivia. And that's why I think it's kind of tied in. I guess Blake Lively's friends or something. But anyways, yeah, it blew me away. I thought Lively was just a coincidental last name. You think Blake Lively truthers are watching this movie? What (laughs) is happening? The big reveal for Amin was that Blake Lively is loosely related to Robin Lively. And that it led to something with this movie? Pretty much. That's That's my trivia. 1989 was a busy year for Robin. Uh, she starred in KK3, she starred in Teen Witch, a TV movie called Not Quite Human 2, which the synopsis is, Chip, the android boy is back! Oh, I read the book! This time, he is off to college. I, I swear to God, I read the book as a kid. Suffering from a computer virus and in love with Roberta, another android. Will there be a happy ending? It was a whole series of books, man, about Chip the android. She was also in the TV series Teen Angel Returns. 
1989, and an episode of 21 Jump Street. Nice. We also get Dan Gauthier, Gautier, I don't know how you say it. Gauthier. Gauthier. Like the song. Yeah. Somebody! And that I used to know. Who you clearly know from the TV series Tour of Duty. <laughs> He's also in Son-in-Law. And he was in almost every quintessential 1990s TV show at some point. He's got the look. Mel Rose plays 902 in all those. And that look is fake Tom Cruise. Fake that? <laughs> I, that's a note I've got. Dick Sargent's also in this movie. Remember him from Bewitched? I wonder why they cast him. <laughs> Team Witch is directed by Dorian Walker, who's best known for Making the Grade with Judd Nelson, Baby Songs, ABC, 123, Colors and Shapes. I love those songs. So, Zach, Making the Grade has no critic rating. Does that make it eligible? No. Okay. Zero divided by zero is not a number, so it's not a rating. So we need to call Tony and get him to submit one bad rating so we can review this movie. Because it's Judd Nelson and Andrew Dice Clay. I guess you could say, according to Zach, it didn't make the grade. See, the movie's called Making the Grade. (laughs) And it didn't have a score. So Zach said, if it doesn't have a score, we can't review it. So hence, it didn't make the grade. Written by Robin Menken and Vernon Zimmerman. Robin has also written a movie called Young Lust, which is a soap opera parody that stars Fran Dresser and uh, Dana Carvey. Oh, that sounds delightful and not annoying in any which way. She was also uh, in This Is Spinal Tap. Really? Fringe part. Vernon wrote a TV movie called Shooting Stars that had Billy D. Williams in it. Oh. He also wrote Fade to Black, not the Jay-Z documentary. Ah, uh, to America's. <laughs> Synopsis for Teen Witch. High school misfit Louise, at a loss for romance, discovers magical abilities, but the teenage witch finds that she cannot conjure herself true love. So what? (laughs) Tagline. To her, trouble comes supernaturally. Oh, that's actually kind of witty. Because it's like supernatural. Another tagline. Fall under her spell. Okay, that one is not so. No estimated budget on this one, but it grossed 27.8. Jeez. No, it definitely didn't cost 27.8. That's not 27.8 million. It's $27,843 U.S. to be precise, U.S. and worldwide. Ah. But again, we don't know the budget, so I don't know if it's a hit or a flop. Budget, $2.5 million. Woo, that is rough. Gross, $3,875 in its opening weekend. Yeah, how'd they get up to $27,000? Tickets were a lot cheaper back. Not that cheap. <laughs> It went up against Field of Dreams and Pet Cemetery and got dusted. Jesus Christ. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, there you have it. The studio didn't want it to succeed. For listening to the rest of this podcast, Teen Witch is available on HBO Go. Rotten Tomatoes score for Teen Witch, 38% from critics on eight reviews. So that's just, what, three for five? Rotten Tomatoes has a 75% rating from the audience on over 12,000 ratings. Wow, okay. I guess you don't like it as much as you thought you did because you're surprised by that. I'm staggered that it's that popular. A lot of human beings that watch movies used to be teenage women. Uh. (laughs) Ouch. You want (laughs) positive or negative reviews? You know, I'm uh... (laughs) a... I'm an optimist. Zach, give me the positive review. <laughs> wow, everybody's just thinking about the negative. Well, I think the, the glass is half full. Everybody thinks it's half empty. All right, our buddy, caffeinated Clint of Movie Hole. Oh, this guy. A treasure from the golden age of comedies. <laughs> no, I mean, that's not real. Michael Dukina of TheMovieReport.com. A fantasy comedy, romance, and musical, all for the price of one with such only in great bad movie treats as a funky white rapper busting into rhyme every now and then. Pretty accurate. Felix Vasquez Jr. of Cinema Crazed. The unapologetic cheesiness and truly awful values of Teen Witch is often so bad and yet so damn charming to endure. (laughs) Accurate. User Glad W gave it 5 out of 5 stars. If you like campy and lighthearted, this film is for you. It's classic teen cheesiness. There's dance montages and some singing. Don't watch if you're looking for a moral in the story. This is just fantasy fulfillment for any hopeless romantic who wish their teen years were more like these films. It's fun. If you're looking for a cerebral flick, you're looking at the wrong movie. Zach, this person was talking directly to you. User Amanda L, 5 out of 5 stars. This movie is hilarious. It's definitely aged well. If you like movies like The Craft, Mean Girls, and Heathers... This is right up there with those. I can't believe I waited too long to see it. It's nothing like The Craft, Mean Girls, or Heather. <laughs> it's like if you took those three movies and put them in a blender. That's offensive. And then threw out the contents of the blender. <laughs> and then just handed the blender blade to your child and say, here, 
lick vigorously off of this. <laughs> User Dana C, four and a half out of five stars. One of the most iconic movies of the 80s. Corny? Sure. Cheesy? Definitely. Like, totally awesome fun? Oh, yeah. See, I, that disappoints me. Is it really iconic and I just never knew about it? $27,000. That's what it made. It's not iconic. User Al P gave it five out of five stars and the entire review, and I counted them, 38 question marks in a row. But why? It's a great question. There's 39. <laughs> Negative reviews. Austin Trunick of Under the Radar. Unless you were one of those people who grew up watching it air on cable over and over again, Teen Witch probably isn't going to register much of a blip on your interest meter. It aired on cable? Heather Bomer of Common Sense Media. That's Bomer with an M. No. Oh. Damn. Tubular 80s teen fluff. Silly, fun, and shallow. That sounds like a positive to me. David Nusser of Real Film Reviews. There's not much else here to keep viewers over a certain age engaged. Wow. Shit on millennials, why don't you? User Graham B. Half a star out of five. If you tried to make a parody of the worst 80s teen flicks, you couldn't come close to this pile of garbage. Not even funny bad. Truly atrocious. Get out of here, Zach, with your burner account. User Steve S, one and a half out of five stars. Due to the recent RT changes that have basically ruined my past reviews, I'm mostly only giving a rating rather than a full review. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Take a stand. <laughs> User John T, two and a half out of five stars. In the spirit of Footloose, 30-year-old high school students singing shitty songs, demonic and slutty behavior, basically encompass this movie. Demonic? Well, I guess witchcraft. I don't know. Oh, I guess, yeah. User Hannah S., one out of five stars, didn't even finish it. Oh, <laughs> Hannah. <laughs> Hannah. Ralph R., one and a half out of five stars. I remember the horrible rap scene from this film on occasion, and it usually followed by waking with a cold sweat. It does have that creepy midget lady. Someone likes it, I'm sure. <laughs> I think you could say that, Rob. Zelda Rubenstein! Wow, you guys are going to love this. There's a point where I discovered that she is a little person. <laughs> this is the last one. User Adam G, one and a half out of five stars. This might be the most ridiculous things I've ever endured. Netflix thought I'd like it, but I didn't even think <laughs> think that could be true, so I ignored the recommendation. Then I saw a clip of Serena Vanderwoodson of Gossip Girl on Dave Letterman, and she was talking about how her sister was in a movie called Teen Witch. When she said Teen Witch, a bunch of people in the audience freaked out and cheered. So I added it to my cue. It was retarded. Love is the real magic. God. Blake Hively. Also. We got our word. The R word makes its way in. <laughs> Once an episode, ladies and gentlemen. Once an episode. We're back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, what's your first note? My first note is, drum roll, please. Drum roll. The best credits ever. <laughs> Get out of here. Oh, my God. The saxophone and the drums. Saxophone! And the slow motion technology that hadn't been perfected yet. So it looked like stop motion photography. And the song, Never Gonna Be Single Again. So catchy. And it lasted forever. Four fucking minutes. We're opening with a sexy-ass saxophone playing. Slow motion silk fabric blowing in the wind. Then it's not quite slow motion. No, it's not. It's more like stop animation. Robin Lively is standing on a rooftop, twirling in slow motion and some, well, stop animation, and some 80s hunk is walking slowly toward her. Yeah. She sees him walking and drops her silk shawl. Wait a second, isn't she supposed to be in high school? Is this legal? Fakes a kiss and spins away from him. Footwork on the spin was a little rough, but it worked. He's looking like a discount Tom Cruise in cocktail. My next comment, who is this dollar store Tom Cruise? <laughs> I called him Tom Cruise. They're slowly dancing. She's walking away, climbs up on a ledge. He's doing like the most amazing Metal Gear Solid creeping approach. It's hard to describe this, but it's like a bad video game animation. <laughs> snake! 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 <laughs> Who the fuck choreographed this thing? Four minutes into this movie, we've only had this. No explanation, no witchcraft, no character names. I don't even know which fucking city they're in, I mean. I figured it out later. I think they're in San Francisco. What? She walked up steps or on ledges and is trust falling into him and then her alarm goes off. She wakes up. She's definitely in high school. Her brother is under the bed eating chocolate. <laughs> At 7 a.m. Going to town <laughs> on a chocolate cake with the box. And I'm talking about, when I say going to town, I'm not talking about like, a slice that he's gingerly eating. I'm talking about his face is just 
blotchy with chocolate stains all over it, both hands. This box is torn open. He's like, it's like he's never eaten before. He's just under her bed eating while she's sleeping. <laughs> That's where he went for privacy. What's wrong with him? He's got something, right? He's acting his ass off is what is he's he? got. <laughs> is he? We'll examine that in, the, in, in due time. Huh, touch me and die, lady. Yeah, no, he called the sister lady, which I thought. <laughs> There's something going on. Uh, <laughs> user reviews hit the nail on the head there. He starts like basically revealing things that shows that he's read her diary. Talking about Brad, and I wish Brad would kiss me. And I and I started thinking to myself, why did kids keep diaries back in the day? They don't. Nobody keeps diaries anymore, right? I like to keep a diary when I'm traveling. I can't really keep up with it on like a day to day basis, though. I try keeping a diary as a kid, and everything was like today was all right. I went to school, nothing happened. Nothing happened today. Nothing happened today. And I realized, like, why am I doing this? This is homework. Why am I doing homework? And I stop. He's teasing her about someone named Brad. The red hot lover. She sees that he's read her diary. She snatches it back. He still has a crumpled up page. He's a psychopath. I mean, this kid, there's something really wrong with him. You know what he looks like? He looks like my man from Police Academy. Oh, I thought he looked like Rosie O'Donnell. No, no. He looks like my man from Police Academy. You know, the guy who talks like this. Bobcat Goldthwait. His character in Police Academy has a mullet just like the kid. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like he's reading some kind of erotic fan fiction. It does. This movie, I, I like several times I asked myself in this movie, who's the, the target here? Who's the target audience? It's a great question. My next note, Fifty Shades of Meh. Wow. <laughs> no? That's no good? No. All right, family breakfast, and um, I just have a worry that Amin's going to pick up on a vibe between the dad and the daughter. Did that happen? No, no, no. The dad seems completely disconnected from the family at all times. He says this is his favorite daughter, but it's also his only daughter. Yes. Or is it? Meanwhile, Richie, I had to rewind this several times. He's got two skewers with like eight Pop-Tarts on them that he pulls out of like a catering dish while listening to headphones. Something's happening with him. Right? This is the first episode I can truly say I regret this isn't video. That's why I thought about it. I wish we had watched this on the train because then we'd have cameras. So many things that I, I, I had to stop myself from sending you guys in the chat. Things that are happening in the background of this movie. Robin's Jewish friend rolls up on a bike and they see the heartthrob guy pick up a hot blonde girl across the street. This is also a nice neighborhood. Nice neighborhood. That house is gorgeous, the one that Louise lives in. The hot blonde that lives across the street comes out dressed, you know, a little risque for going to school. Yeah. But the Jewish friend finds it's okay to start slut shaming. Yeah, there is some slut shaming in this. She calls it sleazy. Yeah. Called a whore, basically. They ride their bikes to school. My next note is just the Leasty Boys. This caught me really off guard. I was not expecting this. How could you? How could you, Maze? How could anyone expect this? Drink it out town and we're feeling cool. Don't really need to be hanging in school. It's okay, we got nothing to lose. Can't you see, baby, it's a high school blues. Parents in the because it's a waste of our time. Because anything that we we'll learn about making a dime. What the heck, we know that we are no fools. Because we're getting stuck with the high school blues. Excuse me, pretty big. Are you sure you go to high school? I don't even know how to describe these guys or any of the wardrobe they're in in this movie. Their attitude is kind of like 50s doo-wop gang down by the corner, but they're trying to rap. And they're white. I mean, they're super white. Super white. They are abiding to the one fedora per crew rule. Uh, Everyone's wearing a vest. (laughs) It's the 80s, baby. Suspenders. Suspenders all over this. Big movie for suspenders. Oh, it's the 80s, baby. Fedora douche says, are you sure you go to high school? And I'm like, dude, are you sure you go to high school? (laughs) They got a point. Because why is she dressed like that? She's dressed like a like a 60-year-old librarian. She chose these clothes, got dressed, came downstairs looking like she's somebody's mama's mama. And also, the rap song that they were singing was the high school blues. Who among us haven't felt those, huh? Don't 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 try to make them relatable. All of the songs were created for this movie. We'll get to that later. Of course they were. These aren't real songs. They couldn't be real songs. I thought for a second that maybe they were going to be, but it gets worse. Teen Wolf 2 has a much better soundtrack. Teen Wolf 2 had had bangers. (laughs) Send me an angel. That's a future callback right there. Send me an angel. 
You know what I realized? What? If we're releasing these pod episodes in order, then it's not a future callback because they don't know that. It's a back to the future callback. It's a future callback for us. Yeah, it's a back to the future callback. It's not even a future callback for us because we already recorded that podcast and talked about it. Yeah, we had to go back to the future to reference it. Right. It's a callback. <laughs> <laughs> Some nerds walk up, say she's a shoe in for Latin Club president. Hot girls talk about Brad taking her wherever she wants to go so she doesn't need a car from her parents. And then the teacher is just roasting her for being late. Do you guys recognize the teacher? No. Who is he? You don't? Oh, yes. It's Shelly Berman. He's Larry David's dad from Curb. No That's way. it? Wow. Wow. As my father says, which means every nice shoe ends up into a house shoe. Wow. Wow. Yo, my favorite thing about the teacher, why is his desk on a stage? Like like Colin Cowherd. Like, it's just massive on top of it. Like, you need stairs to get to the top of the stage. Also, it's a classroom. Why is there a bookcase behind them? It is. A, it's, it's a weird setup, yeah. It's a desk on a stage, and there's a blackboard behind them. And I'm just trying to – and it never factors in. So I just thought to myself, the set dresser for this movie, like, why did they go with this? Why didn't they just go with a regular classroom setting? Why did they feel the need? As they turn in some assignment about romance, her diary page that was ripped out is stuck to her homework. By what? What's it stuck by? Which at first I thought, adhesive with a piece of shit, because it looks like shit. And then it, <laughs> I just put it together now that that was chopped. Yes. It's the cake. From the brother. Yeah. Yes. Mr. Weaver asks, why is it that romance is dead? And my man with the fedora says, Rhett. all the chicks are a drag. And he just starts snapping. <laughs> is he going to do this all movie? <laughs> Rhett is a prize pupil in every class, man. If you need someone to turn it out, Rhett is your man. He reads it out loud about Brad's kisses. Then he calls out Robin and she runs out of the class. I don't feel like you could just run out of class at any point. I love that the teacher is just an immense dick about this, man. He would, I mean, oh my God. I mean, what a dick for reading that out loud. Then I was like, I kind of respect it. Also, Louise, fucking wipe off your homework. What are you doing? How does she not notice that? That doesn't make any sense. She's a cat lady in the making. The Jewish friend is in love with her, right? There is some tension there. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some. Yeah, okay. Cut to a locker room of cheerleaders and music starts playing and she sings, I like boys. This girl runs up to the other cheerleaders and just yells, hey, cheerleaders, because that's totally natural dialogue. That's how they address each other. Yeah. I got the new cheer. I like boys. (laughs) And they sing this song. Where all the lyrics of the song are just, I like boys. I like boys. <laughs> How are you not laughing at this, Zach? I was in pain. Does this count as being a musical? I wrote, what in the footloose is going on? Is this a musical? Amin, did you make us watch a fucking musical? It's not musical? a musical because... They don't actually sing anything. <laughs> they're not singing, first of all. And second of all, Louise, rather than joining in or storming off, It's kind of like... Just watches. Yeah, watches as any teenage boy would watch if he he were in the girls' locker room. This is a question I have. Is she a cheerleader? She is later in the movie, but was she a cheerleader at that point? This is just P.E. Because later on they go by the pool. And that's their swimsuits. There's some choreographed dance going on. It's terrible. They're doing bits with towels. It lasts over two minutes. Yeah, they're pretending to shower. They dry their hair with hand dryers. There's a girl casually walking on someone's shoulders. Football practice. And Brad does the best juke I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) It's basically just him curling into the fetal position and wiggling his shoulders slightly. And the other guy just runs right by him. And then Brad pops up on the other side ready to throw a ball. Louise is watching like a creep from afar. He rips his shirt off at one point. He's also practicing by himself. He's just throwing through a a suspended tire, which I cannot figure out in the middle of an open field where that tire is suspended from. Also, Brad takes off his shirt. Jesus, are you sure you're in high school? Yeah, (laughs) Brad. Brad's been doing HGH for 14 years. I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> 12 and a half minutes in, I still have no idea what this movie's about. Setting the scenes, Zach. Brad and Robin are auditioning for a play. Okay, this is the point where I start to think to myself, what the fuck is going on with the editing of this movie? Yeah. There are no establishing shots. There's no transitions. A lot of these scenes are really short, except for the musical sequences, which last forever. 
but we're just cutting right into stuff and it doesn't stop. The question I ask is, whoa, what kind of play is this? Because when they go out there to audition, they're finalists for this for the lead roles, her and Brad. Brad sits down and she instantly gets on her knees between his legs. Extremely horny scene. Yeah, it's a real horny scene. That's the beginning of the scene. Brad's a real renaissance man, you know, like yeah. football practice, lead in the school play. If I have a criticism of this movie, just one criticism. Just one? It would be that they made Brad too nice. Like he's actually a decent guy. He should have been a jerk and instead he's not. There really is no comeuppance for Brad. He's just a, a decent guy who happens to bang the school skank. Wait, whoa, whoa now who's slut-shaming? I mean, slut-shamed her. What's wrong with Randa? Is she just a skanky person? Is she? She's perfectly nice. No, she's not nice. The whole thing about Kiki's singing voice, we'll get to it. Robin didn't get the lead role, but she's going to get to be the assistant costume designer. Is that how that works? Every movie about high school where they have a drama club, you're a finalist for the lead role, the next step below that is assistant crew. Not even like the head of the crew. You are an assistant. You are a bitch. She's riding her bike home at night. Brad is driving the hot girl home. She's eight seconds away from blowing this dude in the car. Yes, she is. Hubba hubba. It distracts him, and he basically runs Louise off the road. Teen Wolf 2. It's our second straight teen movie and our second straight run on bicyclists off the road movie. Teen Wolf 2 vehicular homicide moment is what I call it. Right up, Brad, for a DWH, driving while horny. <laughs> he gets out, helps her. But barely knows her name. She jokes that it was a failed suicide attempt. This got dark. That's dark. <laughs> I said, yikes, that's dark. Hot girl doesn't want to give her a ride despite his offer. How big is her coat, by the way? Yeah, Jesus. my God. It's Shaq's coat. She's walking the bike home, and it's lightning out. There's a payphone she tries to use. It's out of order. 17 and a half minutes into this movie, still nothing has happened. They're establishing context. That context. A lot has happened. <laughs> Let's be clear. None of it meaningful. <laughs> it's... Right. It's all meaningful. It all, it all part of the puzzle. There's nothing witchy yet. She gets to a house that has a sign for Madame Serena, some kind of fortune teller. She wants to use the phone, but this woman, uh, this is the woman from Poltergeist. Zelda Rubenstein. I like your cutesy little Punky Brewster face. Yeah. Robin Lively was in two episodes of Punky Brewster. Oh, really? Oh, see, there you go. Real meta for you there, I mean. Yeah, there's tip of the cap, a little, like, touch of the nose, a tug of the earlobe, for those of you who are paying attention at home. By the way, I feel like Serena, very gypsy name. Oh. And I wanted to know if we can call Serena Morales right now just to ask her if anyone's ever asked her if she was gypsy. Can you say gypsy? <laughs> yes, you can say gypsy. You can't say jip. Jip is bad. Gypsy is a real thing. She offers a palm reading, but asks how much money she has. Is that what she's offering? She has $6. Clearly, I can't be the only one who sensed it. No. no. Way. Come on. You I mean, don't no, hold no, on. No, no, no. You got, okay. The right, Jewish go friend, I will say sure. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll get to that point later. I felt it immediately, but I know by the end of this movie, you guys will have gotten to this point. Spoiler alert, she takes the psychic to the prom. No? Okay, all right, go ahead, go ahead. Watch me be proven right again. She has to put money on the offering plate and cover it up. She's talking about her future husband, someone she already knows. She gives her name Louise Miller, and Serena says, it's you, you're one of us. She's going to receive these powers on her 16th birthday. Strange things will happen. Louise is not convinced and leaves. Cut to her birthday. And this dumb brother is wearing a tuxedo shirt. Maze, please play the line from Talladega Nights about the tuxedo shirt. I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says, like, I want to be formal, but I'm here to party, too. Because I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party. He is twitching and hovering above this cake like he is about to hump it or inject it into his bloodstream. Oh, yeah. No, he's about to eat that cake out. Maybe it's just a cake addiction? Him and Theodore Rex. Does he have an undiagnosed form of diabetes? (laughs) He ought to. (laughs) As As much sugar as he eats. But there is someone who fiends for something more than this kid fiends for cake and more than Theodore Rex fiends for cookies in this movie. We'll get there in a second. Oh, God. (laughs) I think I know what you're talking about. All right. I don't think you do. Creepy Brother says nobody's coming to her Sweet 16 party. No one's coming to your Sweet 16 party, Louise. (laughs) Her Jewish friend calls and says Randa is having a party the same night and everyone's going to that. Maybe the Creepy Brother's the fortune teller. It's like birthday on Elm Street. Shouldn't it be Nightmare on Birthday Street? That would make more sense. (laughs) That's pretty funny. 
Here are the, here are the funny things to this scene for me. One, the mom is kind of hot, but also she's kind of a douche. Two, the age gap between mom and dad. Very peculiar. <laughs> Did you guys pick up on that? That the dad is like a good 30 years older than the mom? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dick Sargent's way older than this woman. Third, the Jewish girl, what is she, in The Wire? She's calling from a payphone, like, <laughs> in this really deserted urban street. By the way, Randa's having a party at her house on the same day. Where's Randa's house, guys? Do you guys remember? Across the street. Across the fucking street. So why is the Jewish friend calling from, like, Market Street, downtown San Francisco, with hobos and zip heads everywhere? Meanwhile... This party is happening across the street, but somehow Louise hasn't picked up on it. Then we don't see the party. We don't see Polly come over. Louise is just in bed, and there's a callback to the prophecy. Yes. <laughs> a callback where she's having a wet dream about the psychic. Not a wet dream. She's literally just recalling this woman's words. There's nothing sexual about it. Her face is floating above the bed. Well, she's a, she's a witch. I've seen Ghostbusters. How do psychics stay in business? Well, they know when the recession's coming so they can prepare for it. <laughs> <laughs> Rent. Power bills, like food, the set dressing, right? It like, kind of feels like they can trick people with their minds into not having to pay stuff. No, I'm not talking about in the movies. I'm talking about like, because it's not like this isn't a movie thing. Well, so I think a lot of it is often owning the property. I would assume that it's passed down family to family. <laughs> wow, because they're gypsies. Good job there, Zach. No, because otherwise, how could you afford the lease? That's what I'm asking. Right. So I'm giving you a solution. So if that's the solution, wouldn't it be easier just to lease out? the space and not work no because i think there's an addiction to conning people wow whoa all right moving right along what you think they're real no nah, i think you, you just said the gypsies are addicted no to i'm saying people. you said gypsies Psychics. i haven't said the word gypsy once in describing these people yes these people little people now we're back at school and it's sex education class with the home ec teacher the frumpiest home ec. i've been asked to teach sexual education like she's about to faint at any given moment in this whole thing pulls out an umbrella and my man Rhett comes with the ultimate dick synonym soliloquy does anyone know what what this might represent a Roger, a loved one, joystick, dong, zipper, lizard, tally, whacker, trouser, snake, schlong. That, that's enough, Fred. Thank you. No problem. No captions for this. No, yeah. No. They, they got embarrassed. They, get, they, they felt shame. By the way, did you guys get a look at the blackboard in the background? Yep. It says, Sparky the sperm, and it's racing towards Edna Egg. Yeah. Uh, when it reaches, it makes a baby. Now she pulls out a condom and says to use one at all times. The crowd starts, or the class, <laughs> crowd, starts reciting condom in a chant. They don't start reciting it because what happens is she pulls it out and she says it. This is actually a very well written scene. This is a condom you are to use this at all times and the class says condom like they've never heard it before like you know those movies with the original man who is being taught like you know encino man and stuff like that they're being taught modern words and so they all say condom and they start chanting it together in unison serena has just texted me i'm calling her back right now hi serena you're, you're being recorded right now Amin has a highly offensive thing to ask you. I have a highly offensive thing to ask you. This is Zach asking that question because of he's, course it is. he's talking in my headphones so you can't hear him. The question oh, okay. is, how many times have you been asked if you're either psychic or a gypsy, given that your name is Serena? Oh, is that an offensive question? I guess. You can't say gypsy. If I'm a psychic or a gypsy, this is a Zach Harper question. Yeah. No, it's not it's a Zach a, Harper yes. question. No, it's not. I'm <laughs> calling her right now. Hold on, I'm calling her right now. I mean, right I think now. I am a psychic, but I've not been asked. Actually, never, never been asked enough. with the name Serena. Never. Oh, no. well, there you have it, Zach. All right. Thanks, Serena. Zach is calling you right now. Oh, don't, don't pick it up. He's, he's just confused, I think. All right. Thanks, Serena. Bye. <laughs> Bye. We got to com complete this podcast. Are you? No, I, it is not a Zach Harper question. This. Now Amin is trying to backpedal in my earphones. I have a three o'clock hard out. No, that was something that Amin said that Serena is a gypsy name, which I don't even think you can say that. That sounds highly offensive. And two, <laughs> then said, oh, I bet Serena's been called a gypsy before. How do you guys get into this on your podcast? There's a fortune teller named Madam Serena in this movie. Have you seen really? the movie Teen Witch from 1989? Oh, no, I missed that one. Okay, it's awful. Today. 
Yeah, yeah it's on okay, HBO, but it's okay. terrible. So, all right. Okay, bye. Bye. I hope you got all that. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Are you calling her back? <laughs> What? Hey, Serena, I, I just want to <laughs> clarify that Zach took a lot of liberties in that call. And I don't think that is a, an accurate representation of the conversation that we were having on the podcast. Also, Teen Witch is available on HBO Go. So if you have HBO, you can go ahead and watch it. It's a very funny movie. And then that way you can listen to our podcast and enjoy many of the inside jokes that we're making. What a great plug. Wait a minute. So you both are doing the podcast together, but you've called me separately on two separate occasions. Yeah, I just had to rebut some of the kind of latitudes that Zach took on his end. Uh, so, but anyways, right. we do have a hard out, so I, I, I do have to get going. Thank you for having a lot of time for us here, and I can't wait for you to listen to this, this episode. I can't wait. Luis can't get the product placement Coke machine to work. It's a large Coke machine. Brad does the hit the machine, and it comes out move. But first, he gives it a nice little gentle stroke to find oh, the right sure. spot. Sure yeah, does. you got to, yeah. You don't just slap them, Zach. You got to, like, make them feel comfortable first. What? I'm talking about machines. I was picking up the sexual tension between Brad and the Coke machine. Oh, he's definitely fucked that Coke machine before. Yes, that's how else would he know what it likes. <laughs> Here's the kicker. She gets her Coke, walks away. The kid standing behind her in line, who when she's having problems with the machine, is letting out all sorts of groans, like, gee, are you really kidding me or whatever? When she walks away, he goes to the machine, and he looks like he's having the hardest day ever, and all he wanted to do was a goddamn motherfucking Coke. He is so stressed. It is so funny. I rewound and watched it three times and laughed hard every single time i just wanted one fucking coke and this dumb bitch doesn't know how to work the machine everybody knows she likes to be stroked on the side and a good hard spank louise tells the drama teacher that her life is a walking talking tragedy she's never seen this necklace before mrs malloy who looks like bill walton in drag she does look like bill Walton. oh my god what a great call she gives the the necklace to louise for no reason take a look dear it looks like it's very old. And then they hold the shot to hammer home that this thing does not look old at all. Says it may bring her luck. Randa stops Luis in the hall, says her cousin David needs a date for the dance and asks if she wants to come with them. <laughs> her Jewish friend makes her say yes. Louise, she didn't ask me. Maybe she's really starting to like you. This is another, another great scene because she stops her in the stairwell. And there are so many people walking up and down this motherfucking stairwell. It is prime time. And then this guy walks by in the background. What the fuck? I'm telling you, this movie has so much shit happening in the background that it's just unexplainable. Because it's got nothing going on in the foreground. That's for damn sure. Right, exactly. Because nothing's happening. All right, Dad wants to know why she's upset. She says her outfit makes her look like a geek. She is wearing a sweater over a pillowcase and a burlap sack skirt. I know you not talking with the way your ass dress. <laughs> She really is dressed terribly, though. He shows a pic of her mom in junior high. Was the dad the school principal? <laughs> her date is this weird, psychotic nerd who kind of looks like Moshe Kesher. No, he looks like J.J. Abrams. The hair, the that is J.J. Abrams. We're at the Harvest, and Ramondo, your favorite radio DJ... Raymondo. ...is playing the music. Problematic as fuck. And I need an origin story for Ramondo. Raymondo. <laughs> he says it's their time to sow their wild oats. He looks like he got electrocuted. He's so problematic. He's 47 years old and has the poly D blowout. He was a real DJ for K-Rock who died last year from a brain tumor. Rest in peace. Oh, that's a shame because he looks so creepy. He should not be within 500 yards of a, of a high school. What is the dancing that's going on? This is like really spastic. It reminds me of the dance scene in Teen Wolf, the original Teen Wolf. Also... We're about 40 minutes into the movie. Not a single person of color has shown up. Not even once. I have a note about that later. Right. <laughs> I know when. If you don't dance, we shoot at your feet. Whoa! Why are they in a barn? Brad walks in wearing a fucking bolo tie. Yeah. Louise goes to the bathroom, changes outfit into something more modern. Completely transforms herself into the typical 80s girl. The nerd laughs at her. Oh my God, this laugh. Yes, who? <laughs> he says she's trying to embarrass him in front of a bunch of strangers she roasts his bow tie and his haircut dr demento this guy in the red shirt is fucking killing the dance floor <laughs> this guy and the power mullet is 
amazing. Yes. I called him Steve getting it, Berg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, grab your wallets because here comes the slow song. Where the fuck does Romando think he is? What does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> does that mean get the condom? I think so. He's problematic as fuck, this Raymondo. Slow song time, and Brad and Randa are dancing together. The nerd asks Louise if she wants to smoke some weed. You want to smoke some weed? No. No drinks, no weed, no pot, no pills, no roaming hands. Like a narc, dude! (laughs) And you cannot tell me that Jon Stewart did not get that (laughs) delivery in Half-Baked from that dude on weed she says no to a lot of things she stops dancing with him sits down with her jewish friend and says that she wishes brad would just look at her and he does she wishes he would come over and he does leaving randa he asks to talk to her they go outside look at ramondo in the background He's doing the Stevie Wonder. He's got sunglasses yeah, he's on. Got sunglasses on. He's, he's got a dumb fucking smile he's on his face. He's the star of this fucking movie. Let's As be he's bobbing his head back and forth. They go outside to have a talk. He says, can I come over to your house? And she says, I have a little brother I know about men. What does that mean? It means that I think we know why little Richie is acting so erratically. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. He has to come over. He says he needs help with the English paper so he can play football and go to USC. I have proof of that. It's not just an accusation. I have proof it's coming up. David gets his keys and Randa takes Brad away. David then says, the night's young. <laughs> Let's party. I can drive through the fog like a hog with a heart on. What does that mean? And then he oinks. <laughs> He's now aggressively me too in her while he drives. How about some soul kisses, baby? With- <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I took that directly as a overtly racist remark. Oh, absolutely. Well, oh, wow. that's what I was wondering about Rhett the whole time. I mean, Rhett's just appropriating. This dude is saying, let me rape you because that's what black people do. Give me some soul kisses, oh. baby. Oh, how would you like it if somebody groped you? I love it, baby. Come on. <laughs> hey, I got an idea. Let's do it while we're moving. Ah. Ah. Stop it. Ah. Ah. it off. <laughs> Give me one kiss I'll be nice. Ah. He's- cartoonishly raping her if that's a thing that i can say she wishes he'd leave her alone and he disappears immediately she steers the car to safety poorly she drives the car home to take her bike to madam serena's who's closed and then she bikes all the way back home why not just drive the car to madam serena's because she can't drive as evidenced by her poorly parking the car she bikes home the creepy brother is making a marshmallow pizza is that what he's doing because i i I wrote what's wrong with this kid making a pizza pasta and there were marshmallows i just saw pasta sauce everywhere and just shit all over the kitchen you think you're hot stuff because you went to a dance dream on that's a great line nobody wants to date you because you are a dog a dog a dog he immediately becomes a dog talking to her she puts him into a bubble bath and he becomes human again bubble bath is already drawn well because they do have to hide him being naked when he gets out of the tub he says get off me you pervert yeah and that's how i knew she's been molesting her little brother for years what? oh my god that's why he's like that he wasn't mad that he was under the bed she was mad that he wasn't in the bed <sighs> maze I, wait, wait. what do we do here you don't sense the sexual tension between the two of them? All right. Do I sense the sexual tension between a 16-year-old girl and her 11-year-old brother in this movie? No, I do not. I didn't write the movie, Zach. Maze, uh, it's just you and me talking here. I mean, so horny for there to be sexual tension in these movies. I'm not. He, I'm not horny for it at please, all. Please, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm, talking I'm talking to my friend here, okay? <laughs> please just give me a second. Is that what he is now? <laughs> Now you find sexual tension here? <laughs> hey, I didn't write the movies, Zach. I didn't write this dialogue either. Now she's back with Madame Serena. She finds out she's a witch. She can make anything she wants happen. Serena sees the necklace, then shows her something every witch must see. It's a book of new faces of 1652. Shows her a pic uh, with the same amulet. She and the amulet belong to each other. It's a symbol of her powers. She does a spell and turns a clump of something into cash. Serena is the next picture over. <laughs> The fuck? They're on the same page. It's good they made those witches' yearbooks back in 1652. Yeah, well, you had to, you know? Memories. Uh, Madam Serena says they can make the kids at school respect her. She's reading a book about magic on an empty carousel at night by Lantern. In order to prove that she's not a little girl, she goes to carousel, reads a spell, makes it rain, and then dances in the rain. Yes, this is very mature. Also, hurt people hurt people. She keeps going out there. Think about this. Father, 30 years older than the mother father clearly has a thing for 
young tenderonies, right? Father molests the daughter. What? Daughter what is happening? Molests the, the little brother. And that's why they're all weird. I know they edited this movie really poorly, I mean, but you couldn't have been picking up this much subtext. Okay. Did you click on the extended edition again, like with Hall Pass? <laughs> Perhaps. She's in the locker room with cheerleaders, does a truth-telling spell. The Jewish friend walks up to her asking what she said. She covers it with, it's a new U2 song. Imported. I did like this. That was a great line. <laughs> Astaroth, Barabbas, Tetragrammaton, Theos, Ishinos, Athetos. <laughs> it's a great line because U2 songs are also gibberish. Now the cheerleaders are talking shit to each other after saying how great they're of a singer they are. Kiki's mom is an alcoholic. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the thing. One, they're like, you're not a good singer. She says, you're Alki mother. And then the other girl goes, yeah, your mother's a joke. <laughs> and she goes, well, who are you? Princess Die? You're too lazy to cover your roots. And then she gets pushed in the pool and her spell is off. Madam Serena is doing a spell with the toad. Louise shows up and wants to make Brad love him. Serena tells a high school teenager, with her help, Brad will become her love slave. Uh, do you want to write any of these down, by the way? Like, as she's giving her all these spells, like, Louise has the greatest memory ever. Together, they make the toad disappear, gives her a potion to put on her bed, and says with, to say the spell with Brad on her bed. Another connection to uh, Teen Wolf 2, second movie in a row with the frog. Oh, that's right. Yeah, good call. Frog disappears. She says, where did it go? And Madam Serena says, don't worry, I know. And I put in parentheses, it's in her pussy, isn't it? But that was a legitimate, sincere comment by me. Lo and behold, as she kicks Louise out of the place, goes back, opens the door, the toad has turned into a handsome prince. And I said, ha, I was right. Toad has become a Trump child. <laughs> it does look like Eric Trump, doesn't it? Brad comes over to her room. Sounds she changes like the mood lighting. <laughs> They sit on the bed and her creepy brother walks in. She threatens him with dog food for dinner. Where are all the chairs? He walks out. Dad walks in, asks where all the chairs are. He was hoping to catch them in the act, by the way. You notice that? Of course I noticed it. He brings them milk and an apple. <laughs> she can't go through the spell. Also, we found out his name is Brad Power. Brad doesn't have a backpack? No, he just carries his books. He carries nine books. He has a lot of books. Well, he's strong, man. How do you think he's so, it's so ripped? In the movies, nobody had backpacks. They always just carry their books in their hand, and I actually did this when I was a kid in school. Like, I, I went through this phase where I didn't want to carry a backpack because I was like, yo, it's like they always carry their books, and then I kept dropping them. So I was like, shit. <laughs> of course, you're a child trying to wield these books. It's like a zillion books. She pulls the chairs out of the closet, no more bed. In class, Brad apologizes for letting Luis go home with David. By the way, where is David? He's a missing person! He gone. It's been more than 48 hours. It's technically a, a cold case. Where did he go? And he's a minor. Right. A couple of facts about David. He was a pilot in the movie Point Break. Wow. Also, he's a technical advisor on the movie Next. <laughs> it was a highly technical movie. <laughs> it was, man. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Teacher breaks up their conversation, takes her birth control, and says, just thinking about it, eh, Louise? How is that acceptable? Yo, this dude is a motherfucking G. Because he opens the, the birth control, and it is, like, untaken. You know, you got to take a pill every day. And it's, like, pristine. And he's, like, just thinking about it. I was like, yo, if I were in that class, I would have got up and daffed him up. Oh, I, you would have to. That is the coldest shit I ever heard in my life, man. <laughs> she creates a voodoo doll of the teacher. I feel like we're mixing things up too much here from a witchcraft voodoo scenario. I feel like they were very broad with this. <laughs> uh, it makes it kind of racist, you know? Back to class, she hides the doll but undresses the doll as he's speaking. He starts with the bow tie, then he takes the jacket off. He rips his shirt off saying it's hot, kicks the shoes off, pants come off. Before he takes his boxers off, the principal walks in. He's fired by now, right? Talking to them about Hamlet. And he says, some of you may have experienced this conflict if your parents are divorced. <laughs> And I was like, this motherfucker's a G. Then as he's talking and he's undressing, you know what he's doing here, right? He's acting his motherfucking ass oh, off. Oh, right? okay. Acting his ass off. And it gets better because Louise goes home and puts the voodoo doll right on like the end table. that's right there in the, by the doorway. Walks away. Little brother comes, finds it. Starts playing with it, or not playing with it. He just kind of like takes it with him upstairs and then decides to just throw it off the stairs. The teacher hurls himself down the stairs. <laughs> I laugh so hard, man. The mom then picks it up, carries it off, puts it in a washing machine as the teacher is walking home. Nope, she doesn't put it in the washing machine. She plays with it first. Oh, yeah, she plays with it first. She makes it pretend to walk around the rim of the washing machine before throwing it in there. 
Meanwhile, the teacher is walking down the street, and lo and behold, a car wash is right there, and he decides to walk right into the car wash. I asked the question, what if there wasn't a car wash there? What would have happened? It's a great question. If there's a fountain, does he just go into the fountain start? But if there's nothing? Also, we get our first minority of the movie. Yep, we got our first one. Guy working the car wash. Tips him for the hot wax. Now we cut to the drama teacher. She won the state lottery without buying a ticket. She bought a new wardrobe. She got her hair done. She met the man of her dreams, an Argentine count. Armando Lagando. <laughs> this dude has a mustache, Latin music plays. <laughs> and he drives an Alfa Romeo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now we have a Leasty Boys appearance. The girls ride up on them, and the Jewish friend likes the lead guy. I'm king, and they know it. When I snap my fingers, everybody says, sure, I'm hot, and you're not. But if you want to hang with me, I'll give it one shot. Top that. My bad? No, I'm not in the mood. Oh, oh my God. You can dream until you blue, but you will never top that. <laughs> Let's go back the other way. No, just, just go up and, and talk to him. Are you kidding? I'm so embarrassed. Look at how funky he is. I will never be hip. I'm hot, and you're not. But if you want to hang with me, I'll give it one shot. Top that. Top that. You can do all that you can, but you'll never top that. Top that. So top that. Not respected, who would ever really want to go and top that? Such a waste of pretty face, but hanging in your nose face. I wish that you would take a look and really stop that. Top that. Well, stop that. I don't really give up about trying to top that. Top that. Stop that. I wish you finally take a real look and really stop that. What's this? Stop that. What gives? Stop that. I don't really give up about trying to stop that. Top that. Big deal. Stop that jewish friend rapping her ass off she's fantastic louise goes to madame serena wants to change her look wants to be the most popular girl it's too big of a spell for her powers serena decides to help her anyway she's using the last of her powers to help her out gives the spell to become shauna who's a pop star so they show up to the, the concert right they sneak in the back door and as soon as they walk in saxophone the green room is right there and i said huh so it's not just us that have an easily accessible green room that literally anyone walking off the street can just walk in and steal shit from. That's right. That happened to us multiple times. The best part is security is after the green room, right? Like security is like deeper into the arena or the venue. And the security guy is our second minority of the movie. Yeah. Right. We're on a run now, boys. And he has lines, Zach. He does. He has a couple of lines. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah, he says, you weren't on that list a second ago. <laughs> it makes him sound like a dumb fuck. Shauna eventually gives the jacket up to help with the spell. And by the way, Shanna can get it. I just can't do this 80s hair, man. I don't know. It. Her hair looked awful. Maze, let me tell you. I can't. <laughs> you know what's funny? I just <laughs> imagine Zach showing up to the next five. With the hair looking like that. I told you I could do this 80s hair. It's not far off from being that long. Why is it so brittle? Oh, because I came in it. <laughs> you don't come in your hair? Put a little product in it? We learned that in There's Something About Mary. We sure did, and they got it from this podcast, Future Callback. <laughs> Louise does a spell, and she kind of looks the fucking same, right? She just has some eye makeup on. That's what I thought. Her hair is different, I guess. A little bit. She's spinning and starts generating light and smoke. That's how it happens. Brad and Randa offer a ride to school. She leaves her Jewish friend behind. Uh, Suck it, Polly. The rapper likes her. We have a popularity montage. Lots of incoherent dancing. 20 guys show up at her door. More rapping. More rapping. Rappers are rapping for her to get in their cars. Because every cool guy needs a popular girl. In the car, we get our third minority. There's a guy in the backseat of that convertible with Rhett. And it, he's clearly Mexican. Ask me how I know he's Mexican. How do you know he's Mexican? Amit? He's got very, very gelled black hair. Yes. He's wearing a button-down shirt that yes. is unbuttoned. And then he's got a red bandana. Yep. Uh, 
He's repping. Repping for la raza. He's repping his ass off. <laughs> People clap when she walks into class. She and Brad go to an abandoned home in the countryside. Isn't this great? They're playing strip hide and seek. He smashes in an abandoned house. Um, they're fucking, aren't they? Teenagers don't fuck like this, by the way. Saxophone, slow motion kissing. Yeah. He's not a teenager. He's, well, wearing that's a true. Ring. He's wearing a wedding mask. <laughs> He's wearing a wedding mask. <laughs> he forgot to take it off. <laughs> so he took her to an abandoned house to fuck. Is that legal? He's a predator. That feels illegal to say. Statutory. She asked Serena if he kissed her because of the spell. Serena says, what's the difference? Falling in love is a trick anyway. Serena was watching the entire time, by the way. She was psychically creeping on him. 100%. Yeah, you know why? Oh, boy. <laughs> There's a sexual tension there between her and Serena. She tells Luis that nothing lasts forever. He makes her sit in the lap? Yeah, there was a weird, like, she... She sits in her lap, and then they switch, and they sit in the other lap. And you're telling me there's no tension? I think it was just a joke about their size. Okay, yeah, I bet. That doesn't even make sense. Cut to the school play, and they're not supposed to say good luck. She says, break a leg, Kiki. Then Kiki trips over a ladder and breaks her leg. She wanted that shit to happen. Oh, of course she did. They say Louise has to fill in. We never see her fill in. Then Polly comes up and says, geez, Louise. What did you do to trip her? This is where I said, is this where geez, Louise comes from? No, they were just waiting to drop this the entire time the dad says it's not how people see you it's how you see yourself somehow he heard the news from someone other than his daughter (laughs) yeah now she's trying to trying to make up with a jewish friend she's pissed at louise needing to make an appointment she's a cheerleader now for some reason this whole like popularity part where they show up on her front lawn with signs that say louise 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 very well made signs like with the alpha graphics or somewhere like that to make these signs i said this all reminds me of the rick and morty episode where Morty tries to use a serum to make Jessica like him. All right, says there's no room for her in her life. Creepy brother's dressed like a bellhop. She never treats Polly bad. Like in Teen Wolf, they make it apparent that he's mistreating his friends. No, she abandoned her. You became a swan and left me right in the duck pond. You're such a hater. No, she abandoned her friend. She didn't abandon her. She left her. She jumped in the car and left her friend. At, she's like eight feet away. She can't say, hey, can my Jewish friend come over here and take a ride with us? <laughs> it's Jewish. The Creepy brother who has something is dressed like a bellhop. He brings her breakfast in bed with a newspaper and her homework ironed. Why would he iron her homework? A look on his face when he says that is something. Why would he even own this outfit? He apparently also cleaned everything up, unlike the marshmallow pizza he made. Mom wants to know if he's on drugs. Now there's a crowd in her front yard with signs chanting, We want Louise! We want Louise! She sneaks out the back. Brad pulls up. Immediately. He drives into a rowboat on a marsh saxophone brad wants to take her to the dance he says she doesn't play games with people to get them to like her that she's honest she says it's a bad idea to go to the dance says he doesn't know uh something about her then says to go with randa he wants her but she storms off she goes to serena asking for help the place has been redecorated well she goes to the carousel for a second all oh, right she went to the fucking carousel i'm so sick of this carousel Luis wants to reverse the spells serena won't do it also my still where's david where is he <laughs> No one seems to care that this child went missing. There's an APB out for David. She agrees to help her. They have a laugh about sitting on each other's laps. The real magic is believing in yourself. If you can do that, you can make anything happen. Now we're at the dance. Saxophone. Let me tell you, my guy in the red shirt still fucking killing it on the floor. Oh my God, this dude is going hard. Also, the couple in the middle of the dance floor who I believe are trying to grind. Oh yeah, front grinding. Yeah, front grinding. Front grinding, which doesn't work. It was almost like a swing dance grinding, right? Yes. And I'm pretty sure that dude's gay. And we find out that Mr. Weaver, who is the asshole teacher who uh, championed all movie long, did not get fired for trying to take his dick out in front of class. No. Not only did he not get fired, there was no administrative leave or nothing. No, he's just there. He's chaperone in the prom because that's what I want the guy who pulled his dick out. The Leastie boys are there. Rhett says, all right, guys, this joint's crawling with hungry women. Let's make our move. Hungry women. A choreographed dance number to welcome Louise to the dance starts happening. The rapper is dancing with the Jewish friend. And now Louise is the center of the dance. She grabs the amulet, throws it to Serena. There's a dramatic song change. We see Brad and and Randa dancing. He's got his jacket on. Then she tosses the amulet. Then we see Brad alone looking sad with his jacket off. And a tie loosened. Yeah. He went black tie with a blue shirt, by the way. Randa just disappeared like David, her cousin. <laughs> they start slow dancing. They kiss and make out on the dance floor. 
Roll credits. She kind of does the helicopter move Nomi does in Showgirls. There's no payoff. That's it. And there was no comeuppance. Nobody learned anything. No. That's the end of the movie. I was kind of shocked. <laughs> of course. Because there's a point where when she becomes the center of the dance, I clicked on the time. There's like a minute left in this movie. What the fuck's going to happen? Apparently the answer to that question, nothing. They saved money on credits too. They did. <laughs> they really Super did. short. All right. A little trivia. The creepy house that Luis Miller walks into uh, at the start of the movie is the house from the Thriller video. It did look familiar. Yeah, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. During a Q&A session at a personal appearance for the screen, Robin Lively said that the scene in which she and Zelda Rubenstein sit in one another's lap was filmed after lunch, and Zelda had terrible breath, which made it difficult for Robin to keep a straight face. Robin also didn't know that Zelda was in the audience for that Q&A. Oh, that's awesome. Also, there was a Q&A for this movie? <laughs> By the way, this movie's a real love story because Brad and Randa... Married in 1990, and as of 2018, we're still together. That's love. I wanted to say that's nice, and I said that's love. And I yeah, I, yeah, I was wondering what that was supposed to be. Teen Witch is a cult classic, having gained newer, younger audiences after regular re-airings on cable channels, HBO, and Cinemax in the 90s. And then in 2007, ABC Family acquired the TV rights and has since re-aired it regularly as part of their yearly 13 Nights of Halloween movie specials. So there's your audience right there. There's no reference to Halloween in this entire movie. <laughs> Not once. I don't even know what fucking time of year it is. Prom. End of the year. We've got football practice. I guess there's some spring practice at times. By the way, I, I forgot to point out, that's how I knew it was in the Bay Area. Because he's going to Stanford. Brand is going to SF State. I, I didn't think that was like something that you would boast about, right? But I thought it was LA because Kiki is going to Malibu Junior College. Yeah, yeah maybe it is LA, you're right. And Brad did want to go to USC. At a personal appearance during a screening, Mandy Ingber, who played Penny, admitted to the audience that she had an attitude problem on set because she felt the director had no idea what he was doing. She also explained that the infamous Top That number was not in the original script and was filmed during a reshoot. Mandy has since become a yoga instructor and has written a New York Times bestseller on yoga and counts Jennifer Aniston, Jen Lawrence, and Brooke Shields among her clients. Speaking of the Top That scene, we don't have a Tony Medley this week, but there is a 2018 article in Entertainment Weekly looking back at the Top That scene. We wrapped Teen Witch, and a few months later, I got the call that the production company wanted to add some new scenes to the movie. The composer says they wanted to do the reopening of the movie, and they really wanted to come up with a big rap song in the middle of the movie as a feature. So the producers that I met with said, you write rap? I said, yeah, I'll write a rap. And I remember it was one of the hottest days of the year in the summer. And I was driving to pitch this top that to the producers. I kept remembering the saying, never let them see you sweat. Well, sweat was just pouring down because it was so hot and horrible. And I got into this room and there are all these executives and producers sitting there kind of like reel down and out because the first version of the movie wasn't working. So the pressure was on. I do the rap and there's this dead silence. And one guy goes, I like it. And then they all go, oh yeah, we like it. The guy who plays Rhett, Noah Blake, there was a dance studio somewhere in town and they say, you and Mandy are going to be meeting here twice a week with the choreographer. They have choreography? And I remember the choreographer was like, do this. I'm like, really? Do that? I was like, God, that feels really uncomfortable. Penny says, the scene included that I thought Rhett was really, you know, rad. I was like, so you mean to tell me that my character liked Rhett the whole time and I had no idea while I was shooting? Rhett says, there wasn't a lot of continuity or through line. I don't think that the script was really sweated over a whole lot. Robin Lively says, Mandy and Noah were really reluctant to do it. I didn't think much of it, but I'm sure if it had been me who had to do the rap, I would have been mortified and I wouldn't have wanted to do it either. Penny says, when I signed up to do the movie, I didn't sign up to do a musical number or especially a rap. I did feel a bit like, how am I going to do this? This is going to be embarrassing. I didn't really feel like I had a choice, but I did feel a little hesitant. And I actually talked to Dan Gautier, who played Brad the other day, and he used the word mortified. But I thought, screw it. Nobody's ever going to see this. Rhett says, I remember talking to Mandy going, look, we just got to go for this and commit as much as humanly possible. It's going to be ridiculous regardless. And so we did. And in all honest, not honesty, I think that's probably part of the charm of it. Rob and Lively, I thought they were great and I thought it was cute. You have to embrace it. And I think they did. And I think that's why everyone loves it so much. Rhett says, here's an interesting thing. The voice in Top That is not me. I was shocked the first time I heard it. I was like, that's not me. 
I don't know if anyone, maybe until today, knows that it is not my voice. Dude, we knew it's not you. (laughs) Robin Lively, I went to a party at Ricky Lake's house in the early 90s, and she was so excited to see me. She runs up to me and says, oh my god, top that, and starts saying the lines and knows all the music. And I was like, wait, what? I had no idea. That was that moment when I thought seriously. This little movie I did is catching on. Robin Lovely strikes me as someone who does not know that the movie's terrible. Of course she doesn't. So there is a Top That remake with Aaliyah Shawkat from Arrested Development, maybe Funke, and Jack Antonoff from Fun and Bleachers and famous for dating Lena Dunham that they made in, it looks like, 2012. It's 2010. And by the way, the third Leastie Boy in this remake is Natasha Leggero. And when I say she steals the show. She kills it, man. She absolutely kills it with the spastic dances. It's amazing. Then Kenneth wraps it on 30 Rock. Supersonic, idiotic, disconnected, not respected. Who would ever really want to go and top that? Top that! Thank you. That was the rap song, Top That, from the movie Teen Witch. And Lonely Island... Before they were on SNL, back when it was still their website, they did basically a fake behind the music. They called the group Dudatude. Dudatude. <laughs> and it's featuring my man Richardson from Hot Rod, your favorite, I mean. One last thing. Financial backers of Teen Witch had neglected to provide funding for the original soundtrack release. After a decade and a half, the master audio tapes had become unavailable. The Weir brothers were interested in recreating the now popular songs, what? That Larry Weir had written... Alana Lambros brought her long-held view that Teen Witch the Musical was viable as a Broadway-bound production to the project. In 2007, the audio CD for Teen Witch the Musical was released. A new generation of actors were cast in a stage play, which was presented in Workshop. The adaptation never found a larger venue. I could see it working. Near the end of the movie, the character Kiki accidentally breaks her leg. Ten minutes later, she shows up at the dance just fine. Also, where is David? Nobody cares. Golden Dumpster nominees! Richie the brother, <laughs> Rhett, a.k.a. Fedora Douche, Mr. Weaver, a.k.a. Larry David's dad, Madam Serena, David the nerd cousin that disappears, DJ Raimondo. <laughs> DJ Raimondo. <laughs> the editor of this movie, Natan Zahavi, and saxophones. Oh, my God. It's so hard. It's so hard to pick. Oh, man. I'm sorry, Raimondo, but I got to go with what? Mr. Weaver. What? I gotta go with Mr. Weaver. I oh just the, the birth control pill scene that is just man. so savage. Just that, like I said, Louise. I wish I were in that in that class. I wanted to get up and just like dap this dude up. Like, yo, you're the fucking goat right now for that one because he's a teacher. Like, it'd be one thing if it was another student in class who dropped that line. Like, yo, it's a real dick movie. <laughs> this man is an educator. Yeah, it's <laughs> he's talking to children. <laughs> Children! <laughs> oh my god, yeah, yeah. Mr. Weaver for me. My, oh man, DJ Raimondo. God. <laughs> um, I can't give it what? to DJ Raimondo though, because I gotta give it to Steve Gettenberg. My man, the red <laughs> shirt, dancing his ass off. Oh my god, he made, like, he made the movie for me. Alright, this is tough. This is very, very tough. This is the first time that I've seriously considered giving it to someone for doing something just truly awful and that's the editor because i think he is very to blame for what happened here but i'm gonna give it to david the nerd cousin he comes in extremely hot the rapist smoke kisses baby (laughs) want to smoke some weed Weed. (laughs) i mean phobophile as i explained last time if I'm watching a movie and I'm not checking my phone for what time it is, and I legitimately laugh. This again, this is another of the perfect cinephobe movie. It is an obviously terrible movie. I'm staggered that thirty whatever percent of critics thought it was good. It should be something where like three percent. It makes sense that it only made twenty eight grand, and yet I gotta file it, man. I laugh so hard so many times in this movie. I could not breathe when my man went for that Coke machine after Louise walked away. I was in stitches. It was so funny. It's a file for me. I filed Teen Wolf 2. This is funnier. This movie is weird to stack up against Teen Wolf 2. I don't like these stacks that we're doing. I would like to not do this in the future. It had Teen Wolf 2 potential. 
in the first 15 minutes. The first 15 minutes, I'm like, wow, a lot has happened. First 30 minutes even, wow, a lot has happened. Then the movie completely falls apart, completely stops making any sense. It stopped being funny. It was edited by a blind man. It's a phobe. Oh, I thought you were going to set me up for one of those. Oh, the old switcheroo? Yeah. (laughs) I enjoyed talking about this movie with you guys. And I'm wondering how much that should factor in. Well, Zach, let's be honest. Have you ever truly not enjoyed making an episode of this podcast? Hot Rod. You dick. (laughs) (laughs) You're such a dick. Other than that. (laughs) Yeah, that's a fair question. There's no plot and there's no ending. As much as I love the... I mean, really, the Golden Dumpster should just be the background. Right? I know. The background... The whole background is is the reason to watch the movie. Because as you've said, Nace... Nothing's happening in the foreground. I'd never watch it. It's a it's a phobe. I would never watch this again. I wish I could be where David is because I know he can't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> is David dead? Is he alive? Where'd he go? Why didn't his glasses go? Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't the rest of his clothes go? But his glasses <laughs> fell. His glasses. It doesn't fell make any sense. Head. I don't know about witchcraft, but I, that doesn't make any sense to me. Next time we make love. You introduced me to Jade. What are we doing next week? It's my pick? Yep. I need a cleanse, guys. Knowing I need a cleanse, knowing I need a palate cleanser, there's a little little movie on Netflix with one of our favorites called I Am Wrath, starring John Travolta. I Am Wrath? I Am Wrath. I've never seen it. I've only seen a picture from it, and I'm excited for the wig work. So I Am Wrath, starring John Travolta on Netflix, is, is the next movie for us. A new movie? Yeah, 2016. You wouldn't know from the movie poster because <laughs> of the wick work the wig work is spectacular man oh wait oh my god what is this picture <laughs> there's a different pic oh my god <laughs> what the fuck why does he look like sam darnold <laughs> <laughs> i lay my vengeance upon him. <laughs> <laughs>